morning as we worship God in spirit and truth. I'm going to be continuing that series of lessons on some prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament. If you've lost track, this is part five. Somebody might be wondering how many parts this is going to have. And to answer the question, I have no idea. (laughs) Whenever I get done, I'll be done. So however however many parts that is, whether it be few or many, I'm just thankful to have the opportunity to prepare these lessons and to be able to uh, be a part of the worship in the sense of preaching God's word as an element of that worship as we gather here this morning. Luke, in his gospel account, In Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 33, we read that Jesus told his apostles, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. If you go to the book of Acts, when the Spirit sent Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch, we read in Acts chapter 8, verses 30 through 35, So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Of the many proofs that the Bible is the inspired word of God, one of the most compelling, one of the most compelling is the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures which spoke of and pointed to Jesus. Scriptures that were written hundreds of years before Jesus even came to this earth. Scriptures which spoke of his life, the life that he would live upon this earth. His death for our sins, his resurrection from the dead, and the establishment of his church, which is the kingdom of God. And his reign as king of kings and lord of lords, sitting on David's spiritual throne over his kingdom that will last forever, Daniel 2.44. And so, of the many proofs that the Bible is the inspired holy word of God, one of the most compelling is the fulfillment of these Old Testament scriptures fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Things written hundreds of years before he came to this earth to save men from their sins. You remember the apostle Peter in referring to the fact that scripture has as its origin God and not men. You remember he said in 2 Peter 1 verses 20 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, these Old Testament scriptures which spoke of and prophesied Jesus, speaking of things that were fulfilled in Jesus, the origin of these things revealed to the prophets, recorded by the prophets in writing, the scriptures have as their origin themselves God himself. And so today I'm going to be beginning that, or continuing rather, that series of lessons in which we examine some of these 
Old Testament scriptures that speak of the coming Messiah. We're not going to be looking at every single one. Otherwise, I think, and this would be me preaching every Sunday till about 2030, I'm, I'm guessing, if I were to speak on every single prophecy that points to Jesus, approximately 300 of those prophecies of Jesus written in the Old Testament scriptures. But I am going to be continuing a series of lessons in which we examine some of the ones that we find in the Old Testament scriptures which speak of the Messiah, the coming Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And by the way, let me mention this too. Every time that we read of Jesus the Christ, this is really what we ought to be thinking about is when Jesus is referred to as the Christ, in other words, the anointed one, what that's really referring to is this is the one anointed by God, spoken of in the Old Testament scriptures, who would die for our sins, being of the seed of Abraham. The whole purpose of that Israelite nation being to produce the Christ, the one who would bless every single human being that would be upon this earth through the seed of Abraham, that when we read that expression, Jesus, the Christ, this is what we ought to think about. In other words, the one that was prophesied by those Old Testament scriptures, those prophets of God, speaking in those Old Testament scriptures of the coming Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, the one who was foreordained before the establishment of the world, before the beginning of the world, to be the solution to man's fundamental problem, the fundamental problem of sin, which plagues the soul and results in our separation from God. And it's important that we recognize and we remind ourselves of the fact that when we say separation from God, what we're referring to is our sin prevents the fellowship that God desires to have with mankind separating us from God. It's our sin that severs that fellowship that God desires to have with each and every human being that he created in his own image, Genesis 1, verse 27. And so I began this series of lessons with the book of Isaiah. We're still in the book of Isaiah, and again, we're not going to cover every prophecy of Jesus in this great book, but we are going to look at a selected number of prophecies of Jesus in this book, which speak of Jesus and his redemptive work in saving us from our sins. And in later lessons, we'll also be examining other prophecies of Jesus in other books of the Old Testament. But right now, we're still in the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah, as we recall, is often referred to as the Messianic prophet because of the numerous prophecies of Jesus in just his book. We remind ourselves of the fact that his prophetic work, when you go to the very beginning of the book, his prophetic work was directed to Judah and Jerusalem. And when it was during his lifetime that the northern kingdom of Israel was taken captive by Assyria in 722 B.C. And so today, we're going to be examining the prophecy of Jesus found in Isaiah 52, verse 13, going through chapter 53, Isaiah 53, verse 12. I'm going to try to get through at least the first five verses of this prophecy. And most of us, of course, are familiar with the fact that Isaiah 53 is probably the most common place we think of in the book of Isaiah as a prophecy of Jesus. In fact, the very scripture that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading when the Spirit sent Philip to him. But it really begins at the tail end of chapter 52, the very last three verses of chapter 52, verses 13, 14, and 15 of Isaiah 52. And so that's where we're going to begin. And again, this morning, I'll try to get through at least the first five verses, the last three verses of chapter 52, and the first two verses of chapter 53. 
But to tie it all together, let's read the entire section, and then we'll go back to the beginning. So this is Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So, he sh so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What up? precious passage of scripture this is speaking of Jesus and we want to begin going back to the very beginning of that reading the end of chapter 52 of Isaiah verse 13 where again we read behold my servant shall deal prudently he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high so it's interesting in this prophecy that God declares the end from the beginning because the exaltation of the Christ, of course, occurred after his crucifixion, but Isaiah here, speaking from God, speaks of his exaltation, declaring the end from the beginning in the sense that going in a reverse chronological order, pointing to the exaltation of the Christ, that Christ, his servant, would be exalted. The Apostle Paul speaks of this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, that Christ made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now look at verse 9. Therefore, God has also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That's the exaltation that the prophet Isaiah is referring to in Isaiah 52, verse 13. 
Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Christ took upon himself the form of a bondservant coming to this earth, God in the flesh, becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And as a result, being highly exalted by God. That's what Isaiah is referring to in Isaiah 52, 13. Being highly exalted by God and given the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, unto which every knee shall bow. Go to Isaiah 52, 14 now. In this verse we read, Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Before Jesus would be exalted, before he would be exalted, he would suffer at the hands of sinful men. As a result of the brutal suffering he would undergo, the visage of the Christ, that is, his appearance, his visage, his appearance, would be marred more than any man. A good example might be a soldier in the army serving with a fellow friend and soldier in the army, and they go into battle, and the friend is severely injured and his other friend comes upon him and when he first comes to his friend, he doesn't even recognize it's his friend. He is so badly wounded. He has blood, he has scars, he has marks on his body. He has the evidence of a severe wound to the degree, if you read accounts of Iwo Jima, you read accounts of Vietnam, whatever battle, the Civil War, whatever war or battle you want to take a look at, you always read accounts of a friend who comes upon a friend who initially didn't recognize that that was his friend. That's how his appearance is, not even recognizable. Or maybe you think about a first responder responding to a horrible car accident. And the first responder digs into the car with the jaws of life, peels away the metal, and sees this person and doesn't recognize initially that this person is his friend. That's what we're talking about here. That's what Isaiah is referring to when Isaiah says, just as many were astonished at you, so his visage, that is his appearance, was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. And so before he would be exalted, he would suffer horribly at the hands of sinful men, and as a result of the brutal suffering he would undergo, the visage of the Christ, that is, his appearance, would be marred more than any man. That is, his body, and therefore his appearance, would be marred by the brutal sufferings he would endure before his crucifixion and as a result of his crucifixion. The gospel accounts record that though he had done no wrong, though he had committed no sin, yet he was arrested and brought before the Jewish high priest, the scribes and the elders, where men spat in his face. Then they beat him. He was delivered unto Pilate, the Roman governor, who delivered him to be scourged, that is, whipped with cords containing sharp objects at the end of the cords, which tore into the flesh with each single blow, over and over whipped with that, that whip that had sharp objects at the very end of it that literally ripped the flesh off your body. Then, after that, he was stripped. A scarlet robe put on his bloody, torn body, a crown of thorns forced upon his head, a reed put into his hand where he was mocked and spat upon, then the reed being ripped from his hand and used to strike him in the head. Then he was delivered to be crucified. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place 
called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center, John 19, verses 17 and 18. Go to verse 15 of Isaiah 52. Here we read, so, he, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. By the way, the translation here, I'm reading from the New King James Version, the translation, so shall he sprinkle many nations, a more accurate translation of the Hebrew word that's translated sprinkle would be to startle. In other words, so shall he startle many nations. In other words, men, the men of nations, the men of all nations would be startled or amazed or brought to wonderment about Jesus the Christ. So he, so shall he sprinkle or startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not understood, understood what they had not heard, they shall consider. Now, a prophecy here in the Old Testament is best understood in light of what the New Testament reveals about the fulfillment of that prophecy. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, records the fulfillment of this very scripture in Romans 15, verses 20 through 21. He says here, and so I've made it my aim, Paul says, to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. That is, in the preaching of the gospel, in the preaching of the gospel, the mystery, in other words, the hidden truth, what had previously been hidden in the New Testament dispensation has now been revealed. He's using that scripture, Isaiah 52, verse 15, to make that very point, that in the preaching of the gospel, the mystery, that is the hidden truth of God's eternal plan of salvation accomplished in Christ Jesus would be revealed to the world and made available, not just made known, but made available to all men, Jew and Gentile. He expands on this in Ephesians 3, verses 5 through 11, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now we could spend an entire lesson just talking about this passage, but the point I'm looking at here is the revelation of what previously had been hidden, the hidden truth that Paul refers to as the mystery, the hidden truth. Go back to Ephesians 3, verse 5. This mystery, this hidden truth, God's eternal plan of salvation accomplished through Christ Jesus was not known to men in previous ages, but now... Paul writes, it is made known, that is revealed, made known or revealed, 
by the word of Christ, as revealed by his apostles and prophets. Words we have recorded for us for all time in the pages of Christ's New Testament. The word of Christ, the New Testament, the 27 books from Matthew to Revelation. And now go to Isaiah 53, verse 1. Here Isaiah writes, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The fulfillment of this is found in John 12, verses 32 through 38. Jesus said, And I, if, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying but what signifying by what death he would die. Verse 32 there. In other words, Jesus would be lifted up on the cross of Calvary. Verse 32 of John 12. And Jesus said, I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Verse 33. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. That is, nailed to the cross. Verse 34. The people answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Verse 37. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him that the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Here, the Apostle John just quoted Isaiah 53, verse 1. Even refers to Isaiah by name, being fulfilled by the rejection of Jesus by the Jews. In other words, here in Isaiah 53, verse 1, we see a prophecy of Jesus being rejected by the Jews while Jesus walked upon this earth. A prophecy of the Jews' rejection of Jesus, despite the fact, despite the fact that he gave them irrefutable evidence that he was the Messiah. What did the Apostle John point to as irrefutable evidence that Jesus was the Messiah? Well, verse 37 tells us, although, in other words, despite the fact that he, Jesus, had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. And then he quotes Isaiah 53, verse 1. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And so we see that Isaiah 53, verse 1, is a prophecy of the Jews' rejection of Jesus, despite the fact that he did give them irrefutable evidence that he was the Messiah, the Christ, the one prophesied by those Old Testament prophets. Time and time again, they rejected him, despite the numerous miracles, wonders, and signs that he had done before them. That's Isaiah's prophecy, verse 1 of chapter 53, fulfilled. Now, here's a point that we definitely don't want to miss for us here today, this morning. In the most complete sense, this prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled every time a person rejects the gospel. Every time a person rejects the gospel, in, a, in the most complete sense, it's a fulfillment of this prophecy, whether he be Jew or Gentile. When one rejects the gospel, he rejects the irrefutable record that we have of Jesus' miracles, wonders, and signs. Historical, factual, documented, reliable testimony of credible eyewitnesses 
who saw the same things that we read of here in the scriptures, we have all of these recorded for us in the pages of the New Testament. Miracles which prove his deity as the Son of God and Savior of the world. I think it's interesting that in the history of uh, men since Christ died on the cross, numerous men have sought to write books and make cases to attempt to disprove Christianity. And in many, many cases, those very men, when they dug into the evidence, wrote books writing how the evidence proves Christianity. And one that I'm thinking about in particular, I mentioned this to Paul several weeks ago, a man by the name of uh, Josh McDowell. He uh, believed he was a Baptist, but he, he was a skeptic in his college days. And he... He mocked Christians, he, he mocked those who professed Christianity, and he finally got around deciding to write a book that he could once and for all disprove Christianity. Well, his book became, he actually wrote two of them, his books became titled Evidence That Demands a Verdict, in which he changed his mind <laughs> and became a strong advocate of the fact that all the, all the collected evidence proves that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Just an amazing, amazing turn for a person who had been a skeptic, who took it upon himself to examine the evidence. I mean, there's so many men in the history of humanity since Christ died on the cross who sought out to disprove Christianity, but upon careful examination of the evidence, had a big change of heart and a big change of mind. And that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. Because in the most complete sense, this prophecy of Isaiah 53 verse 1 is fulfilled every time a person rejects the gospel, whether he be Jew or Gentile. When one rejects the gospel, he rejects the irrefutable record that we have of Jesus' miracles. Paul writes in Romans 10 verses 11 through 17, For the scripture says... Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Now take very close look at verses 16 and 17 of Romans 10. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. So Paul's talking about those who are rejecting the gospel here. They have not all obeyed the gospel. For, Isaiah says, and he quotes Isaiah 53 verse 1, Lord, who has believed our report? So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Isn't it interesting that a very familiar verse, Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, the fact that God's word is the source of faith is immediately preceded by Paul quoting Isaiah 53, verse 1. But they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So Paul quotes Isaiah 53, verse 1 here, as well as quoting Isaiah 52, verse 7. But notice the point being made here and what we're looking at here is Paul's quotation of Isaiah 53 verse 1 which finds its fulfillment in the rejection of Jesus by the Jews of his day and it finds its fulfillment in the rejection of men today in the rejection of the precious gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now go back to Isaiah 53 verse 1. Look carefully at it. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In other words, belief 
comes by means of a report. It comes by means of revelation. That's the very reason why immediately after quoting Isaiah 53 verse 1, Paul says, so then, he's basing what he's saying on what he had just said, so then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's an important lesson for us because biblical faith, biblical belief is based upon a report. It is based upon revelation from God. The Jews rejected Jesus in the flesh. They rejected God in the flesh, although he had done so many signs, wonders, and miracles in their present, proving himself to be the Christ, proving his deity as the Messiah, the one promised by these Old Testament prophets as king and savior. And again, the point that we don't want to miss is men today commit the exact same sin today when they reject the credible eyewitness testimony of those who saw Jesus, the testimony found in the word of God. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the point being biblical faith, unlike what's touted and promoted in the denominational religious world, biblical faith is not. It is not a blind leap in the dark. You know, it's interesting that when you read the words of skeptics, that when they hear those that profess Christianity saying that faith is a blind leap in the dark. For one thing, that's not what the Bible teaches. And for another thing, you can understand why they think Christianity is foolishness if you really believe that. If you think that faith is a blind leap in the dark based on no evidence whatsoever, because that's not the faith that the Bible speaks of, but that's the faith that's promoted and touted in the denominational religious world that's not Bible faith. Rather, Bible faith is knowledge based on scriptural evidence, therefore based on the reliable testimony found in the New Testament scriptures. And as a result, a person can say with all assurance, I know, not I guess or I speculate, I know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Just like you can say, I know George Washington was our first president. In the same assurance, you can say, I know Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We can say, as did the Apostle Peter in John 6, verses 68 and 69, after some of his disciples left Jesus, and Jesus asked his apostles, do you want to go away also? You remember the words of Peter? John 6, verses 68 and 69. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And look at, very carefully at verse 69. Also, we have come to what? Believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's just, isn't it interesting that Peter here announced the fact that we can know Jesus is the Christ, even though the Jewish religious leaders of his day rejected him, despite the irre irrefutable proof that he gave of his deity as the Son of God, as the Christ, as the one that was spoken of in those Old Testament scriptures. Verse 2 of Isaiah 53 I'm looking at the time going, I'll save that for next Sunday morning. <laughs> if I'm looking at the clock correctly and it appears to be correct, <laughs> my time has expired. So I will, I will pick it up with Isaiah 53 verse 2. Now, one thing with a sincere heart, I would ask each and every one of you, read again this prophecy before next Sunday morning, read again this prophecy beginning with Isaiah 52 verse 13, going through Isaiah 53 verse 12, 15 verses. So I would ask 
sincerely that each of us read over that before next Sunday morning because I will say if you take the time to read over it and maybe look at some companion verses that your mind will be better prepared for as we engage God in worship to hear God's word being preached and to to be able to stay along with the things that we read of in Isaiah 52 verse 13 going down through Isaiah 53 verse 12. So you remember how I began the lesson this morning. I, I mentioned one of the verses I mentioned at the very beginning was from Acts chapter 8. The Ethiopian eunuch, Philip being sent by the Spirit to him. And you remember that in that account, and I read Acts chapter 8 verses 30 through 35, Having read that account, the Ethiopian eunuch, as we recall, was reading from Isaiah 53. And Philip, beginning with that scripture, preached Jesus to him. And after Philip had preached Jesus to him, as they went down the road, the Ethiopian eunuch asked a question. It's a question that immediately followed Philip's preaching Jesus to him. So what was the question? after Philip had preached Jesus to him, expounding on the fact that Isaiah 53 was pointing to Jesus. Well, go to verse 36 of Acts chapter 8. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And here's the question. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus and passing through. He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Why did the Ethiopian eunuch ask the question? Why did he ask that question? See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Why did he ask that question? Because Philip, in preaching Jesus to him, preached the same gospel that Jesus preached. Jesus said to his apostles, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. That's why the Ethiopian eunuch asked the question that he asked. That's why he did what he did. Because Philip, in preaching Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch from Isaiah 53, preached the same exact gospel that Jesus preached. Preaching Jesus includes preaching belief in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Repentance of sins. Confession of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and baptism in water for the forgiveness of sins, for the purpose of having sins remitted, in order to have the forgiveness of sins. That's why the Ethiopian eunuch asked what he asked, and that's why he did what he did. And so, what a precious passage of Scripture this is, beginning with the Ethiopian eunuch reading from Isaiah 53. The divinely given example, among many others, of how to obey the gospel, put on Christ, and become a Christian. Found right here in Acts chapter 8, among other places. And so a little earlier in Acts 8, we learn what one must do after obeying the gospel to continue to receive the forgiveness of sins. So for the one who has obeyed the gospel, in order to continue to receive the forgiveness of sins, we have to repent and pray. Because after we obey the gospel and become a Christian, we will sin. The difference being we no longer serve sin, but we serve him who bore our sins on the cross. 
You remember after Simon of Samaria believed and was baptized earlier in Acts chapter 8, when he committed sin, he was told by the apostle Peter to repent and pray. For the erring saint, that is the one who has obeyed the gospel, we must repent and pray to, con to continue to receive the forgiveness of sins. This is what the apostle John talks about in 1 John chapter 1. But for the alien sinner, the one that is outside of Christ, the one that has not obeyed the gospel, one must repent and be baptized, obeying the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, having your sins washed away by the blood of Christ at the moment that you're baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. And so this morning, these are all the things that we want to consider as together we stand and sing. There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by.